come to you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this day. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to look in your word together. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would teach us, that you would give us understanding, that you would give application, that you would continue to develop and, and stir our hearts into the relationship that you would have with us, and that we would hear your voice and walk accordingly. We thank you and praise you. May you teach us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, in John chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 1. And it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and he taught them. You see, the Lord is always sitting ready to teach you. The, the Lord is always willing to instruct you, to teach you. The question is, am I willing to come to him? I look at the Bible sitting on my table or on the couch, and it's there, and the Lord is willing and desirous to teach me, and I see the Bible sitting there, and I have to ask myself, but will I come to the Lord? Will I, will I sit with Him? I know that at a Bible study or a Sunday service, the Lord is ready to instruct me, but the question is, will I come to Him? You see, I know the Lord is continually waiting to teach me. But I still need to ask myself, am I willing to come to Him ready to listen and ready to learn? The Lord is always there wanting to teach you. And today, you guys chose to come and to hear Him through this avenue, through this means, of a study. You guys have decided, yeah, I am willing, I am desirous, I want to hear the Lord. And I encourage you each and every day that as the days unfold, that the Lord has something to say. That He wants to teach, He wants to instruct, He wants to give you information. And I encourage you today that take the time, listen to the voice of your God, listen to the voice of our Savior, and He truly will teach you. And it goes on and it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, I love when they use terms that they don't mean. Actually, I don't love it. But they used the term, they said Master, and he was not theirs. But nevertheless, they called upon him and they said, This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And Moses, and, uh, and it says, And Moses in the law commands us that such should be stone. What sayest you? You see, the question that arises is she was taken in the very act. Who tipped them off? that that event of adultery was going on. And how did they know? The bigger question is, where's the guy? How come he wasn't brought in to be stoned? Everything about it looks like a setup to try to trip up our Savior. Everything about it, they thought, we've got him now. From healing people on the Sabbath day to this event right here, we've got them. If he says to let her go, then he's going to violate the law of Moses. But if he says, go ahead, stoner, then all his teaching on love and forgiveness is going to come to naught and the people will reject him. And they thought, great, we've got them now. And their heart was to trip up Jesus. 
This they said, verse 6, tempting him, that he might, they might have accusation or ability to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and as with his finger he wrote on the ground, as he heard them not. Oh, I bet with these religious leaders that had to infuriate them. That had to drive them insane, like, like what? What? He's not listening to us? Does he not know we are important? Does he not know we are the leaders of Israel? What, what, is he acting like he doesn't even hear us? Is he ignoring us? And one of them might say, he's writing. Writing? What's he writing? Why is he writing? We're trying to talk to him, and he's there doodling in the dirt, straining their necks to try to maybe see what the Lord was doing as he was writing on the ground. And in verse 7 it says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he again stooped down and he wrote on the ground. The question that always arises is what was he writing? What was he displaying in the dirt as he rode into the earth? And the thoughts are, maybe he was showing them their own sin. Maybe he was listing their names and next to it, the sins that they committed, indicating that they have rejected God. They've rejected the hope of forgiveness. They've rejected their fountain of living water. They rejected their promised Messiah. You see, Jesus had taught them that He is the bread from heaven. He had taught them that He is the living water and that He will produce that life and that water and it will flow from them. But those were to them that would receive Him as Savior. And now they wanted to entrap Him. They didn't want Him to be their Lord. They didn't want Him to be their Master. They continue to want to be Lord and Master of their own life. And so they asked them, they set them up, and they said, What do you say about this woman taken in adultery? And there he's writing into the dirt. And I can't help but think of the passage that declares in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. It says this, O Lord, the hope of Israel... All that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. And I can imagine these scholarly learners of the scriptures that all he had to do is maybe write accounts of rejection and sin and put next to it, or underneath the scripture, Jeremiah chapter 17, 13, that the Lord would write their names in the earth because they have rejected and forsaken their Savior, the living water. And here, upon seeing that, maybe brought back to their memory that scripture, maybe seeing their names and their sins, it started weighing and bringing conviction into their heart. And it says in verse 9, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest. And I thought, you know, how sad. Being older in your life and having a life of unremedied sin as a burden to carry. How horrible it would be for my life that if I continued on even in the age that I am and had the weight of unforgiven sin attached to me like in Pilgrim's Progress, attached to me like as Christian trying to journey through with this weight of sin how horrible it would be when all that sin would continue to come back at me, continue to remind me of my failures, 
of my shortcomings, of the mistakes, the tragedies along the way. How sad it would be to live a life without forgiveness. How sad it would be. How horrible it is when I, when I even do something wrong or I get in my flesh to another person or family member and then I can't see them for a week and I'm, I'm tormented about it. I go to God, I ask Him to forgive me, but it's something wonderful when you can go to someone and you can say, man, I've blown it. I've sinned. I've done wrong. Will you forgive me? I'm sorry for my attitude. I'm sorry for the situation. I'm sorry that I misjudged you. And when you're able to say that and they say, Kirk, it's okay, you're forgiven. Man, what a relief that is. What a... I, it, it lightens my life. It, it, it allows me to, to live in a freer way and to never have that from their Creator, to never truly be forgiven. What a weight that must have been. And the conscience and the conviction upon the people that were there, the religious leaders, those that were the eldest, with the history of the length of sin that they have, knowing that it was never forgiven, they just hung their head and they walked away. And it goes on and it says, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. You see, these scribes and these Pharisees, they were more like Satan the accuser of the brethren. They cared less. They, they could not care at all for this woman. They, they didn't care about the issues that had been going on in her life. They didn't care about the struggles and the strongholds that were upon her. She was just a pawn. She was just a means to accuse Jesus. Yet, there is a life standing in front of Jesus. A life that may have been hurt and damaged by the personal choices that she had made. But nevertheless, it was a life that is precious to the Lord. A life that He had created. A life that, that needed the forgiveness and the, the ability to be set free by her Creator. There was a life standing there, yet the Pharisees didn't see it. Jesus saw it. He saw that life. And He knew her from the day she was born, even before the foundation of the world. He knew her. And He knew as she was young, this was not the path that she had chosen. It wasn't the path that she dreamed of. She didn't dream of this kind of life. She was a little girl at one time. She was young. She had dreams and they were lovely and they were pure. And she thought in her heart maybe someday she would be something. Maybe as a little girl she would dance around the house and she would say, Daddy, Daddy, look at me. I'm a ballerina. Look at me, Daddy. And the dad would say, honey, you're the most beautiful ballerina I've ever seen. And then another time she'd be, daddy, shh, I'm putting my baby to sleep. Oh, honey, you're going to make the most beautiful mom that there ever is. Or maybe she said, daddy, 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 I want to be a princess. I want to be beautiful like Queen Esther. And the dad would pick her up and he would say, my daughter, you are a princess already, as he would swing her around and they would laugh. You see, but then life came in. Situations happened. Choices were made. And her life veered in a direction she never thought it would. Her life traveled down a path. Maybe there was hope and thought of love. 
I don't know what this guy promised her, but nevertheless, she found herself in a situation that she, in her heart, probably never wanted to be in. And now, she's standing for the first time in front of Jesus. She probably thought, this is not the way I wanted to meet him. She probably heard of him. His name was spread abroad throughout the region. And she probably thought, I didn't want to meet him this way. I didn't want to meet him in the state that I am in. I can't believe where my life has taken me. I can't believe what's happening. And the enemy was there accusing, accusing, pronouncing her guilty. The people around her were probably cheering, stoner, stoner, she's guilty. Even the thoughts within her own mind were declaring the same to her. And there she stands in front of Jesus, thinking, I don't even know who I am anymore. Wondering, why did I have to see him in this state? I want to tell you something. That's actually the state that we need to stand before Jesus. A state of brokenness, a state of sin. No mask, no pretense, but humbly before our God saying, Lord, save me. Lord, I can't change my life. I, I can't make it different. I'm not even sure how I got here. All I know is that I have no power to change. I have no power to be free. Lord, forgive me. Free me, Lord. That is the way I came to the Lord. I did not come in my self-righteousness. Those Pharisees, as they dropped their rocks, they should have stood with that woman in their own sin and said, Lord, we need you too. Yet their self-righteousness caused them to walk away. But she, in her humility, said, Lord, I need you. I, I need you. And I came to the Lord broken. I came to the Lord knowing that I'm a sinner, that I could not change my life, I could not make it better, I could not take care of the past mistakes of my life. All I could do is come before my Savior and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, heal me. Lord, free me. And there she stood before the Lord and I believe in her heart she's thinking, I've made a mess with my life. I have no power to change my life. Lord, forgive me. Please, Lord, forgive me. And you see, Jesus does not see you in the same light that the pharisaical, pompous leaders would see you. He sees you in the light of His forgiveness. And there is absolutely nothing of your past that you have done, of your current situation, that is beyond the hand of forgiveness of our Savior. Oh, that we would allow Him to extend His hand out and say, daughter, my son, I'm here. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to forgive you. I'm here to wash you. I'm here to cover you. I'm here to set things right in your life. I'm here to reestablish a purpose, a plan, a hope. I know it was taken away. I know the enemy came in and he stole things from you. But I am here to restore you because I love you. And my heart is always for you. Verse 10, when... Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? The woman was there before the Lord and she responded to him. And she said, No man, Lord. 
that term Lord is a great term. It basically means, Lord, you who has the power to decide, I stand before you. You who have the power to decide my fate. There is nothing better you can do than to put your life into the hands who has that power. And notice what he did with all the power that he had. He said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He extended his forgiveness. He extended his grace. In fact, the way it's written, it's not like he said, now go and you better not sin again. You see, that's a human response. That's what we would say one to another. You better not do that again. Don't, me, don't let me catch you doing that again. That's not his response. He said, go and sin no more. What he was saying is go. You don't have to be a servant to sin anymore. You, you don't have to follow that path that you were on. You, you can actually go and turn 180 degrees and go in a new direction. You, you can go in a different direction. I, I can give you a fresh start, a new beginning, an opportunity. You will wait and see. You've come to me. You've confessed to me. I've got a plan. I've got a hope. I've got a future. I've got a new life for you. I'm going to establish things. I'm going to bring things in order. I'm going to show you along the way that you are been forgiven. You have been forgiven. I'm going to pour blessings down your path and across your way. I'm going to continue to use you. I'm going to give you the life that I called you to have that Satan ripped off, but I'm here to restore. God says, I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to set your feet on a new path. You don't have to follow your sin anymore. In fact, it says there in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We don't have to go that path. I thought I'm never going to change. What's going to free me? What's going to deliver me? And now I've come and learned that it's my Lord Jesus Christ. And not only the day that I asked Him to be my Savior, but every day, every moment, I can come openly before Him. Lord, here's a new day. I need Your forgiveness. I need You to set my feet on the right path, Lord. I need Your power and Your authority across my life. And He is there extending His hand, offering You forgiveness, ready to restore and he told this woman, go, you don't need to sin anymore. This doesn't need to be the defining moment of your life. This doesn't need to be the definition of your life because I have erased it. I have changed it. I've given you a new name and I've written your name in my book of life and I have a plan and a purpose for you. Now go. Do I hear an amen with that? In Romans 6, verse 11, it says, Likewise, reckon you also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, I can live for God now. Man, I couldn't before. Oh, I tried to live a good life. I tried to be a, a so-called religious person, but I couldn't really live for God. I had to come to Him. He had to draw me. And upon drawing me to Him, I accepted Him as my Savior. I repented of my sin, and He extended His forgiveness. He washed me by His blood. He cleansed me from all unrighteousness. He gave me a new name to live by and a new life to follow. And I am forever grateful. And I could come into His presence at any moment with the same heart and the same understanding that He is there and He will forgive me, and He will cleanse me, and He will continue the good work He began in me, and He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What a hope. Verse 12, and we'll close, it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. 
he that followeth me. That word follow means those that uh, who would accompany me on a journey. It, it kind of has that, those that would follow me, you will accompany me on my journey. And that's what I want to do. I want to say, Lord, what are you going to do today? I'm ready. What are you doing tomorrow, Lord? I'm in. Lord, thank you that you restored, you renewed, you forgave, and you placed your spirit inside me that I can now serve you and no longer have to be the old guy that I was. And he said that follow me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light of life. Now being forgiven by Jesus, you and I have the ability to follow him, to accompany him on his journey, to do his work, to walk toward and follow in his kingdom work. And it goes on and says, I want to encourage you from my heart that no matter what you've done, no matter what has happened, the Lord is ready to extend his hand of forgiveness. Let Jesus free you to go and sin no more. And your life has been given a new direction. Walk in it, joy in it, and experience the light of life that Jesus will bring you. Experience the new life he's given you. Do I hear an amen to that? Know how much the Lord loves you. He's forgiven you. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for your grace. May you continue to bless the people. May you enrich their life with your presence. May you go forward and lead us for your kingdom and glory. And we thank you for the rich forgiveness you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want you to know the Lord's with you. He loves you. I heard my phone beep. Let me just see if there's anything that came in. Nope. So uh, I just want to encourage you, if, if you're not getting our emails, please put your name, email, throw it in the offering box and we'll get you connected, and I'll give you updates on how we're transitioning. God bless you, and thanks for coming. Have a beautiful day.